All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. First, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today for this presentation about seeking and obtaining an injunction for protection here in Florida. My name is Katie Cohn, and I'm a supervising attorney here at Legal Aid Service of Collier County. This presentation is being recorded, and I have shared my PowerPoint presentation in the chat, so you're all welcome to to save that um, and I can send around the recording to anyone that is interested in having it if you if you'd like to share it with others in your organization or anyone else you um, think might find it helpful. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. So like I said, today we're gonna talk about seeking and obtaining an injunction for protection in Florida. Um, if you have any questions as we go, I would encourage you to post them in the, the chat box and um, there will be time hopefully for questions and answers at the end. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to kind of juggle going through the presentation and addressing questions, but I will do my best. But I, I encourage you to put any questions you have in the chat box and I'm happy to address them at the end if I don't address them as we go. So just to go through what we're gonna address today, first, um, what is intimate partner violence? How intimate partner violence is defined in Florida? What are the legal remedies for intimate partner violence in, in Florida? What is an injunction for protection? And we're gonna go through, uh, there are several different kinds of injunctions for protection. And we're gonna go through those different kinds, um, and I'll kind of explain each difference, um, each kind and how they're different from each other. Then how to apply for and obtain an injunction for protection, and also tips for petitioners seeking an injunction for protection as you go through that process. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, a question and answer period. So first, what is intimate partner violence? And Intimate partner violence has um, several different definitions and is referred to as several different things. It, it's sometimes called domestic violence, domestic abuse, relationship abuse, um, and the World Health Organization defines intimate partner violence as any behavior within an intimate relationship that causes physical, psychological, or sexual harm to those in the relationship. So for physical violence, that um, is kind of, the, I think, the most self-explanatory and the one that people know the most, slapping, hitting, kicking, and beating. Sexual violence includes forced sexual intercourse and other forms of sexual coercion. Emotional or psychological abuse, insults, belittling, constant humiliation, intimidation or destroying um, your personal belongings, threats of harm and physical harm and threats of taking children away. Um, also for individuals that are undocumented, threats of turning that person over to, um, to ICE, um, threatening deportation. Also for the psychological abuse, it can be things like threatening to commit suicide if the victim ever um, says she wants to leave or tries to leave the abuser. Other controlling behaviors such as isolating, the victim from family and friends, monitoring their movements whenever they're some, you know, out and about somewhere, restricting their access to financial races, resources, employment, education, or medical care. So how does Florida law define intimate partner violence? And kind of the short answer is it defines it as domestic violence. And I have the definition up on the screen, that's the, definition in the Florida statutes, and it is focused on physical violence um, and the threat of physical violence. It does not include the psychological and emotional abuse um, or the controlling behavior. But we will talk about in the process of applying for an injunction for protection that um, in an injunction for protection against domestic violence, the court does take into consideration um, some of those controlling behaviors and um, 
and the threats and the things that aren't physical abuse. And we'll get to that um, as we go. So just some recent statistics for domestic violence here in Florida, in Collier County in 2019, there were um, over 1,600 reported domestic violence offenses, and that's according to the Florida Department Law and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Um, when you do the math, that comes down to um, between four and five reported incidents every single day of the year on average. In Florida as a whole, there were over 105,000 reported domestic violence offenses in the state as a whole, and that comes to about 228 reported cases every day. Now, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, only about 50% um, of domestic violence offenses are reported. So um, about half of incidents aren't ever reported to the police. So these numbers that I just talked through are significant and large, um, but they really don't capture um, the incidents of domestic violence that do happen every day. So we feel that this is um, you know, one of the reasons that we do these sorts of presentations because we do know that there are victims out there that are not coming forward, that are not reporting uh, their abuse and that are in dangerous situations. And we wanna do what we can to reach those people, to help them stay safe and help them uh, keep their children safe. So what in Florida can a victim of intimate partner violence do if they find themselves in that situation? First, of course, is reporting the domestic violence, so the intimate partner violence to the police and seeking criminal penalties through the criminal justice system against um, the abuser. Also, and what we're here to discuss today is filing an injunction for protection against the abuse. And like I said, there's several different kinds of injunctions that you can file. So first, you can file an injunction for protection against domestic violence, stalking, dating violence, repeat violence, sexual violence, or exploitation of a vulnerable adult. That last one, the exploitation of a vulnerable adult, um, we are not going to get into today. That is the newest of the injunctions. And while it does focus some on uh, physical abuse or abuse of a vulnerable adult, generally that means an elder person, um, that statute is quite complicated and it's more focused also on if the vulnerable adult is being um, financially taken advantage of. So again, we're just gonna address the first ones and we're not gonna get into the um, vulnerable adult injunction at this point. It may be the subject of a, of a future, future presentation that we do. So first, what is an injunction for protection? An injunction for protection is a, it's a civil court order that prevents the respondent, the person that you're filing against, from having any contact with you. Um, and it also prevents him or her from going to your home, to your work, to your school, or any other locations that you go often. So that can include maybe your church or a family member's home that you visit, also, visit often. It can also include your children's school, children's babysitter, um, if again, that's a place that you need to go often. An injunction for protection also prevents the respondent from possessing any firearms while the injunction is in place. If the respondent already owns firearms before the injunction goes into place, they will have to turn those firearms over to the sheriff's office for the period of the injunction. And they are not allowed to purchase or possess any firearms um, after that point. The injunction can also order exclusive use and possession of the home that you share with respondent, meaning the injunction can make it so the respondent has to move out of the home while the injunction is in place. It can order that you get exclusive control and possession of a family pet. And this is a new aspect of injunctions that just went into effect this year. It can also order a time sharing schedule for children that you have in common with the respondent. And that's only if you are married to the respondent or if there's been a paternity case or a child support case where paternity has been legally established. Um, and it could also order temporary child support or temporary alimony. 
And lastly, it can also order a that the respondent take certain classes, a batterer's intervention course, and also do a substance abuse or mental health evaluation. And the injunction can be ordered to stay in place for what's called until further order of the court. So until there's another court order that either dissolves or ends the injunction or modifies it in some way. Or the judge can enter the injunction for a set period of time, such as one year or five years. And sometimes when, or usually when um, someone is arrested for a domestic violence crime, a criminal no contact order is put in place that prevents the defendant in the criminal case from contacting the victim. Um, so there, there are some similarities between a criminal no contact order and an injunction for protection. Um, but the injunction for protection is much more broad than a criminal no contact order because the criminal no contact order, all it prevents is contact. Whereas the injunction for protection, as we just went over, can, per, can include multiple different addresses um, and it can also grant, like I said, the exclusive use in the home and those other things. And a criminal no contact order does not, cannot and does not generally grant those things. So um, if you do have a criminal no contact order in place, um, I generally encourage uh, my clients to also seek an injunction for protection um, because again, there are those added benefits. And the other thing to keep in mind is that a criminal no contact order will go away as soon as the criminal case is, if it's dismissed, or as soon as the respondent, the defendant in the criminal case completes whatever punishment um, he has to do as a result of that criminal case. So as soon as he's done with that court process, that criminal no contact order goes away. Whereas the injunction for protection, like I said, can stay in place for much longer, even after the criminal case has resolved. So now we're going to go through the different kinds of injunctions for protection. Um, and the one thing to keep in mind when we're kind of going through these is one of the main differences between them is what is the relationship that you have with the respondent. That is going to be kind of the way, the easiest way to try to figure out which one of these injunctions is best for you to file. So first, the injunction for protection against domestic violence. And to file and obtain an injunction for protection against domestic violence, you need to show that you've been a victim of domestic violence or you're in reasonable fear of imminent domestic violence. So again, remember we reviewed that definition of domestic violence is the, um, the physical domestic violence. So you've been a victim of physical violence, um, or you're in fear that you will be a victim of the physical violence. And this is violence by a family or household member. So that includes spouses, former spouses, persons related by blood or marriage. So that could be a brother or sister, step parent, an aunt or uncle, a grandparent, persons who are presently residing together as if a family or who have resided together in the past as if a family. So that would be more things like um, boyfriend and girlfriend that, where you did live together, sort of as if you were married, but you never were married. Um, or someone, people who are parents of a child in common, regardless of whether you've ever been married, and also regardless of, of whether you've ever lived with the respondent. As long as you have a child in common, you can file a domestic violence injunction. And like I said, you need to establish that you, um, I'm sorry, also you can file for yourself and on behalf of your minor children. If you, um, you will need to show that your children have been victims of domestic violence by the respondent or that they are in imminent danger of becoming um, victims of domestic violence. Um, and it is, in my experience, more difficult to get injunctions for children, um, especially children that you have in common with the respondent. You really need to show that the children um, have been directly kind of targeted by the respondent for the violence 
um, or I've been threatened. Um, you know, the respondent has threatened the safety of the children. But if the children have been present during any of the incidents of abuse, um, I would encourage people to include their children in their petitions um, and seek injunctions on behalf of the children because of the risk that domestic violence does pose to children. Um, I always encourage um, seeking an injunction on behalf of the children if there is any concern that the violence may be turned toward the children or if the children have been present and could have been harmed by the respondent during an incident of abuse. Now, like I said, um, you either have to show that you have been a victim of domestic violence or you believe you're going to be a victim of abuse in the near future. And when the judge is trying to determine if you have a reasonable fear that you are going to be harmed in the future, there's a several different things that the judge can consider. He's gonna consider everything you put in your petition, but he's also specifically gonna to look towards the history between the parties. So that includes threats, harassment, stalking, and of course, prior physical abuse. And that can be even if that physical abuse happened many years ago. In order for the judge to grant it based on you being a victim of domestic violence, generally that domestic violence needs to happen kind of close in time to when you file the injunction. Um, but that close in time, it can be, you know, kind of within the last six months. Um, two years is likely going to be too, too far in the past if nothing has happened in the meantime. But again, the judge can certainly and will consider the history of that prior abuse when he's determining if you're currently in fear, in reasonable fear for your safety. The judge is also going to consider whether the respondent has attempted to hurt the petitioner in the past or the petitioner's family members or other people close to the petitioner. Whether the respondent has threatened to harm the ch petitioner's children or threatened to kidnap them, take them away, keep them from the petitioner. Whether the respondent has intentionally injured or killed a family pet whether the respondent has used or threatened to use any weapons such as guns or knives, whether the respondent has prevented the petitioner from leaving the home or calling the police, whether the respondent has a criminal history involving violence or the threat of violence, whether the respondent has had an order of protection issued against him or her previously, either here in Collier County or in some other court. It doesn't have to be against the petitioner, it can be against somebody somebody else. But again, that will help the judge understand the kind of whether the petitioner has a reasonable fear that the respondent may turn violent against him or her. And also whether the respondent has destroyed petitioner's personal property, including phones and clothing, also including any other sort of communication devices. So that would include computers or tablets, things like that. And again, this kind of goes back to when I was saying that Florida law doesn't generally consider um, controlling behavior or um, things like that as domestic violence, but the judge can consider those things when he's determining whether you have, um, whether it's reasonable for you to believe that you are going to be harmed going forward. So um, while the judge will be most interested in hearing about the physical violence and threats of physical violence, all of these other behaviors um, are also important to tell the judge about so that the judge really understands the situation and can understand why you have that fear that if you haven't been physically harmed by the respondent yet, that you believe that will, and that will happen in the future if you don't get an injunction for protection. So the next type of injunction is injunction protection against stalking. And you have to show for a stalking injunction that you have been the victim of someone who has willfully, maliciously, and repeatedly followed, harassed, or cyber stalked you. And the statute says that harassment is um, where the respondent has engaged in a course of conduct directed at the petitioner, which causes substantial emotional distress with no legitimate purpose. 
So the stalking injunctions are, I would probably say the most complicated of the injunctions. Um, there are a lot of different parts that you have to show and prove to the judge um, in order to get an injunction. So we're gonna kind of break that definition down a little bit as we go here. But um, first, the cyber stalk means that the respondent has engaged in, a, again, a course of conduct to communicate words, images, or language through email or through other electronic communication, which would be things like tweets or Facebook posts, um, Instagram posts, anything like that. Um, it has to be directed at the petitioner. Cyber stalking can also be that the respondent has accessed or has attempted to access your online accounts or an internet connected home electronics system without your permission. And it also caused substantial emotional distress with no legitimate purpose. So both show harassment and cyber stalking. To get a stalking injunction, you have to show that there's been what's called a course of conduct. And that is a pattern of conduct composed of a series of acts. So it has to be more than just one incident over a period of time, even if that period of time is two days, which shows a continuity of purpose, which essentially means that it's just, it's showing that the person is essentially doing it on purpose, um, trying to um, harass you or cyber, cyber stalk you. Now again, one of the reasons that the stalking injunction is, is very difficult is that um, you have to show that you suffered substantial emotional distress. So this is more than just you were upset by it, it made you angry, um, you know, you didn't like it, your kids saw it and they got upset. You have to show that there was some significant um, impact on you as a result of the respondent's harassment or cyber stalking. So this can be if you lost sleep because of this, if you, um, you know, if you were very anxious, if you had to seek counseling, um, if you were, if you had to miss work because you were so stressed by this, again, you really have to show the judge that there was, um, you know, significant um, distress that you suffered. And the other thing you need to show the judge is that the respondent had no legitimate purpose for doing this communication with you. So, um, you know, the, the respondent can't argue that, oh, he was just, he sent you 500 emails in three days because he was concerned about your children. Well, that may not be true. The judge will likely have a difficult time granting you a stalking injunction if in all those emails it does address the children. So while the judge may feel that it's not a good reason and that the way that the respondent went about it was not appropriate, if he feels that there was a legitimate purpose, even if he doesn't agree with the method in which he communicated, you may have a difficult time getting a stalking injunction because the judge may find that communicating about children you have in common is a legitimate purpose. And just to go back, um, the, to file an injunction against stalking, you don't have to have any sort of relationship with the respondent. Uh, it can be someone completely unrelated to you um, and you don't have to establish that you have any sort of relationship. The only things that you have to establish are these different elements of the stalking injunction. The next injunction is against dating violence. And for a dating violence injunction, you have to show that you have been a victim of violence and you're in reasonable fear of continued violence. Or you just have to show that you're in reasonable fear of imminent violence by your dating partner. So if you have been a victim of physical abuse by your dating partner, but say then your partner um, you know, moved to another state or um, was deported or is in prison. And so you can establish that you have a reasonable fear that the violence is gonna continue because 
your dating partner is no longer here and can't um, commit violence against you anymore. In, in that scenario, you, you would likely not be able to get a dating violence injunction because you only have that one incidence of violence. Um, but again, if that, I think that's a pretty narrow set of people. Um, and generally, if you've been a victim of violence and your dating partner is still around, um, you will likely be able to show that you have a reasonable fear of continued violence. So again, for the dating violence, you must have a continuing and significant relationship of a romantic or intimate nature. It has to have existed within the past six months and the nature of relationship of the relationship must have involved the expectation of affection or sexual involvement. And that kind of behavior has to occur throughout the relationship. So um, if you have been in a relationship with somebody and you broke up and then the, your, your ex boyfriend or girlfriend commits violence against you um, and say you broke up a year ago, and then your ex commits violence against you. Um, you will not be able to file for a dating violence injunction because you were not in a relationship within the past six months. And if you never lived together with that person, you also will not, and you don't have any children with that person, you wouldn't also qualify for a domestic violence injunction. So that's why I said at the beginning, a lot of this depends on what your relationship has been, is with the respondent. That's gonna be the best way to figure out which of these injunctions you can apply for. Now the injunction for protection against repeat violence. So you have to be a victim of two incidents of violence um, by the respondent, and one has to occur within six months of filing the petition and the bat violence has to be directed against you or your immediate family. So again, that scenario I was just talking about with the dating violence where if you broke up a year ago um, and you've been a victim by that person, if you've been a victim over the past year of two incidents of violence by that person, one of which happened within the last six months, you could file a repeat violence injunction. Because again, the only, um, relationship you have to establish for the repeat violence is just that there's been violence by the respondent more than one time and the most recent one happened within the last six months. And then the last kind of injunction we're going to talk about today is the injunction against sexual violence. And to seek um, an injunction against sexual violence, you have to show that you have been a victim of um, any one of those following um, sexual um, offenses. Um, and that's regardless of whether the person, the respondent was ever arrested or charged with anything. So that includes sexual battery, lewd or lascivious act committed on or in front of someone less than 16 years old, luring or enticing a child, sexual performance by a child, and any other forcible felony where a sexual act is committed or attempted. The other requirement for a sexual violence injunction is that you must have reported the sexual violence that you're seeking the injunction based on. You must have reported that and to law enforcement, and you must have cooperated with any um, criminal investigation or um, criminal proceeding that resulted from your report. Um, or the respondent has to have been sentenced to imprisonment as a result of the sexual violence. And either the, that prison term has ended or it's going to end within 90 days. So even though you have to report the sexual violence, that's a requirement. If charged, like I said in the beginning, if charges were never filed, um, you can still file a sexual violence injunction, you just have to show that you did report that um, sexual violence to um, law enforcement. Now, if you um, want to file a sexual violence injunction on behalf of a child, the petitioner has to be the parent or legal guardian of the child, 
and the child has to live with the petitioner or the legal guardian filing the petition. Um, and if the respondent, so the person you're filing against, if the respondent is not a parent, the petitioner has to show that they have reasonable cause to believe that the child was a victim of sexual violence. If the respondent is a parent, a step parent or a legal guardian, the petitioner has to have had the petitioner has to have been an eyewitness to the sexual violence. They either they have to have or they have to have physical evidence of the sexual violence or they have to have affidavits from other eyewitnesses of the sexual violence. So if the child um, that you're filing on behalf of, if they're filing against a parent or step parent or legal guardian, it is harder to, to get an injunction against sexual violence for that child um, because the bar is higher. You have to, like I said, you, ha you have to have either seen it, someone else has to have seen it and is willing to sign an affidavit that they saw it, um, or you have to have physical evidence that the sexual violence occurred. All right, so now I'm gonna go through um, kind of the process of how do you go ahead and get one of these injunctions for protection um, that, we reviewed, that we have reviewed. And the first step is determining what type of injunction for protection to file. Um, and again, like I said in the beginning, I, I think kind of the easiest way to think about that and maybe figure that out is to first think about what kind of relationship you have with your abuser, um, with the respondent. And again, if you have, if you are married to him or her, or you have been married, or you were in a relationship where you were living together, or you have a child in common, or you're somehow otherwise related to the respondent, the domestic violence injunction is, is gonna be, I think, likely what you're gonna wanna file for. Um, and I would, encourage everyone to to seek legal advice in applying for injunctions for protection um, because a lot of this i think as everyone has seen as we've gone through these slides um, there are a lot of kind of nuances and differences in the law and and getting legal advice is going to be i think the best way to make sure you're applying for the right one um, and you kind of get everything in the petition that you need in order to have your best chance of having an injunction for protection granted. Um, here at Legal Aid, we provide assistance with injunctions for protection. Um, so I would encourage everyone to, to reach out to us here at Legal Aid. Um, if you are thinking of filing an injunction, um, and the Shelter for Abused Women and Children here in Naples also provides assistance with um, seeking injunctions for protection. So there is assistance out there. At the end of this presentation, I have a slide that has um, our number, the shelter's number, and some other community resources um, for assistance in, in this regard. So that'll be at the end. So once you figure out which injunction to file for, you have to complete a petition for injunction for protection and other required forms. And those other forms, it will depend kind of on your situation, but everyone will have to file what's called a cover sheet, which just tells the court what kind of case you're filing. Um, and everyone also has to file what's called a notice of related cases, which just tells the court if there are any other cases pending between you and the respondent, such as a child support case, um, a paternity case, a divorce, anything like that. And there are also information sheets you'll have to fill out um, with your, your name, your address, um, telephone number, and also the respondent's name, address, work address, telephone number, things like that. And when you file an injunction for protection, you can keep your address and your phone number confidential. There's a form you can complete that will be filed and will ensure that your address and your phone number will not be disclosed to the respondent and will remain confidential. So you can keep those things um, from being disclosed to the respondent if you don't want him or her to know where you're living. So just um, another form you may have to complete if you're asking for temporary child support or alimony 
when you file your injunction, you'll need to complete a financial affidavit, which states what your current income is and your current expenses and any assets or debts that you have. And the court will need that if they are going to order any temporary financial support. But when you're completing your petition, that's gonna be the most important document when you file for your injunction. And you're gonna to wanna to include all the incidents of violence or threats of violence that have occurred. And you wanna start with the most recent incident and work your way backwards. Um, <clears throat> and again, that list that we went over with the domestic violence injunction about um, things the judge is gonna consider about your fear of becoming a victim, including as many of those things as you can, is gonna be, um, it's gonna make your chances of getting an injunction um, as high as they can be. Because the important thing to know is that you cannot talk to the judge in court about anything that isn't in your injunction. So if you forget to include something, unfortunately you're not gonna be able to talk to the judge about that incident unless you change your petition. So that's why it's important to make sure that all of those incidents are in the petition from the beginning. Um, and you wanna be specific but also concise in your description of the incidents. The judge doesn't need to hear everything under the sun um, that it happened before an incident or after an incident. You really wanna um, make sure all the incidents are in there, but that you're describing them specifically about what happened um, and then going on to the next incident. Again, stay focused on, on the violence and your fear of the continued abuse um, and try to leave any other issues regarding parenting or financial issues out of the injunction because as we discussed, those generally are not going to be enough for you to get an injunction. All these forms that I'm talking about and there are different petitions for each different injunction. These forms are located on the Collier County's website and it is here in, in the petition for you. The Collier County Domestic Violence Clerk, which is where you will file your injunction for protection, is located on the third floor of the Collier County Courthouse. They have forms available at the office also. And they also have computers there. Um, and I believe you can, can complete the injunctions on the computer at the clerk's office if you don't have access to a computer. So once you file, and you have to file your injunctions in person, uh, you have to go to that third floor clerk's office and you have to hand in your paperwork. And then once you file it, you're gonna have to wait at the clerk's office until the judge makes a decision on your petition. So as soon as you turn in your petition um, and that other paperwork I told you about, the clerk's office sends the petition to the judge um, and the judge is gonna review the petition and the judge is going to make a decision on it to determine if you are in imminent danger of violence by the respondent based only on what you've written in your petition. And the judge can do one of three things. If the judge believes that you are in danger of violence, the judge will grant a temporary injunction for protection and will also set a hearing on the petition to happen within 15 days. If the judge does not believe that you've shown that there's been, that there is an imminent danger of violence, but you have alleged that there has been violence in the past or that there may be violence in the future, the judge can set a hearing only, so not grant a temporary injunction, but set a hearing within 15 days. And the, the last thing the judge can do is just deny your petition, um, right, kind of at the outset. And that, the judge would do that if the judge doesn't feel that you've laid out anything that, even if he were to hear from you in court, that there's no way you can get an injunction based on what you've written in the paperwork. If your injunction is denied, again, I would encourage you to seek legal advice um, here at Legal Aid. 
um, with the shelter or with the private attorney to determine whether it was maybe how you wrote the petition, um, if you left anything out, maybe you filed the wrong kind of petition. Because the judge is not going to tell you specifically why he's denied the injunction. Um, if you did leave something out, you can file what's called the supplemental petition to add in things that you've left out and the judge will reconsider whether you need a temporary injunction or to set a hearing. So once a hearing is set on the petition, um, the petition and the temporary injunction, if one was granted, will be served on the respondent by the sheriff's office. And then the next step will be that you attend the hearing on your petition. The hearings here in Collier County are happening in person, um, although almost all other hearings have been done virtually since the start of the pandemic. Here in Collier County, the domestic violence hearings happen in person. You are required to wear a mask going into the courthouse and keeping the mask on during the entirety of the time you're in the courthouse, even during your testimony to the judge. <clears throat> So at the hearing, there are a couple scenarios where you may not go forward on that day with your hearing and you may have to come back another day for a hearing. One of those situations would be if the respondent hasn't been served yet with the paperwork. So basically the respondent doesn't know that he has to be in court that day. So you'll get a new date at that time to give the sheriff's office more time to serve the papers on the respondent. If you know that the respondent has a different address or if you know a better address where they might find them, it's good to bring that address with you in court um, because you can provide it to the clerk who will give it to the sheriff's office in the hopes that um, by the time you have to go back to court, the respondent will be served and you can actually have your hearing. Another situation that may arise um, that may require you to have a new date for a hearing is if the respondent has a pending criminal case that's related to your allegations in the petition. And um, the reason that that is often a, um, why you would get a new hearing date is that the, all of the domestic violence hearings are recorded. And because there's a criminal case pending, anything that the respondent says in the domestic violence case, it can be used against him in the criminal case. So generally the judges will continue the case to allow the criminal case to be resolved and then you can have your hearing on the injunction. If a temporary injunction has been granted, that temporary injunction will stay in place the whole time. Even if you get a new date, you'll still have your temporary injunction in place um, until you have your final hearing on your injunction. So if the respondent was served, and there isn't a pending criminal case, then you will go forward with your hearing on that day. And going forward with the hearing means that it's your opportunity to tell the judge about what has happened, why you're filing for an injunction, why you need a, fi a final injunction um, to continue to protect you against the respondent. You as the petitioner um, get to talk to the judge first and testify first and you'll want to have all of your evidence so any photographs of injuries or damage to your home text messages emails anything like that you'll need to have that printed out in advance so that you can give those copies to the judge also if there's been any witnesses that that you want to have testify so someone who's seen the violence or someone the respondent told about what he did to you those people need to be in court that day, that day of your hearing also, so that they can talk to the judge about what happened. Once you um, present your testimony, all your evidence and your witnesses to the judge, then the, res the respondent is given an opportunity to do the same thing. After you testify, the respondent or his or her attorney um, can ask you questions about your testimony. And my biggest piece of advice, and we're gonna to get to some other um, pieces of advice in a bit, but the biggest piece of advice that I have for petitioners testifying in court or witnesses is to always tell the truth, always be honest, 
Um, that goes for when you're testifying, when you're being asked questions by a respondent's attorney or by the respondent, him or herself. Um, the judges are generally, that's one of the main things they're doing is trying to weigh credibility and fault, who's telling the truth, who's not. And a lot of that is what they will um, base their decision on, who are they going to believe? Because a lot of times this can come down to the petitioner says one thing, the respondent says the opposite happened, and the judge needs to figure out who's telling the truth. So then after you, after the petitioner provides his or her testimony, then the respondent will present their testimony, give evidence that they have, have witnesses testify. After that, the judge will decide whether to grant a final injunction for protection. So some tips for appearing at your hearing on the injunction. The first tip is once you have filed your petition, um, generally, I would say to not contact the respondent after you file. And that's not because the petitioner will, could get in trouble for contacting, but if generally or most of the time, one of the reasons that you are filing an injunction is because you are afraid of the respondent because you don't want to have any contact with the respondent. So if you continue to communicate with the respondent after you file, the respondent can argue to the judge that you're not in fear of him or her, or you don't really want, not want to have contact because you've continued to keep that contact. Of course, if there's an emergency, if you need to communicate with the respondent about children's issues or things like that, and you have no other way to um, get information to the respondent, that's, that's understandable why you may have to contact the respondent for those limited reasons. So arrive on time to court. And court, um, you have to also build in time for some extra procedures that are going on at the courthouse. So they're only allowing one person at a time through security. And um, you're asked questions when you go in and your temperature is taken. So it takes longer to get into the courthouse than it used to. So build in some extra time and plan to, to get there early so that you can get through that line and get to the courthouse on time. Go directly into the courtroom when you get to the courtroom if it's open. Okay? There's not always a sheriff's deputy um, or a bailiff out in the hallway, but there will always be one inside the courtroom. So for, um, for safety, go into the courtroom when you arrive and petitioners, Jenny will sit on the right side of the courtroom and respondents on the left. But again, once you go in, generally the um, bailiffs are gonna ask you, are you a petitioner or a respondent? If you filed the petition, you're a petitioner. Dress comfortably, but dress appropriately. These domestic violence hearings can take, you can be in court for a while because there's a lot of cases that are assigned to start at the same time. So you may kind of go in and be one of the first cases called and be able to leave relatively quickly. But you also may be the last case called and you may have to be there for two, maybe even two and a half or three hours. So um, you're gonna be sitting on a wooden bench. And so keep that in mind. You obviously wanna be comfortable if you have to stay there for a while. You also don't wanna be distracted by something that you're wearing when you're trying to focus on talking to the judge about what's gone on. Um, but also be smart in what you wear, dress appropriately. Um, you want the judge to take you seriously. Review your petition and practice your testimony in advance. Um, going to court in any situation is pretty stressful and nerve wracking. When you have to go in and address these very personal um, traumatic events that have happened to you and do it in front of strangers but also in front of the respondent it's understandably hard and i would encourage you to practice your testimony in advance so that it's not the first time you're going through it and i would also encourage you to practice it out loud um, so that again it's not the first time you're saying these things out loud and there is a difference between kind of going through them in your head and saying them out loud. 
And because it can be very emotional and scary, I think the more that you practice it in advance, um, that it will be easier to kind of work through that fear and, and still get your testimony out, even if um, it's a very difficult situation for you. During your testimony, take your time, speak slowly and clearly. Like I said before, there is the requirement that everybody wear a mask in the courtroom. <clears throat> so, and that's even during your testimony. And we all know talking through a mask is not always the easiest thing. So make sure you speak loudly enough um, and clearly enough so that the judge can hear what you're saying. Also, if the, the judge may ask you questions through your testimony if, if they have a question about what you're saying. If you don't understand what the judge is saying, again, the judge is also gonna be wearing a mask. Or if you just don't understand what the question means, ask for some clarify, ask him to repeat it or say it in a different way. That's completely fine. You wanna make sure that you're answering the question that the judge asks you. And that goes the same for if the respondent asks you a question or the respondent's attorney. You wanna make sure that you are answering the question that they actually asked and aren't saying something different from what they asked you. Also, like I said before, have your evidence printed for the judge um, in advance. If you can also have a copy for yourself and the respondent, that would be best, but you definitely need a copy to hand up to the judge. The judge isn't going to be able to take your what stuff that you have on your phone or on a tablet. It has to be a hard copy piece of paper that the judge can enter into evidence and consider when they're trying to determine whether an injunction should be entered. Um, so again, that evidence may be text messages, emails, call logs, photographs, prior injunctions for protection. Um, for photographs, if you can get color photographs, those generally will be, will be more effective. There, you can see any injuries more clearly on a color photograph than a black and white photograph. Don't interrupt the respondent or the judge when either one of them is talking. And this more, I think, the tip is more focused on the respondent. Um, there is always a tendency, I think, to if somebody is saying a lie or saying something that's not true or not telling the whole part of the story to want to jump in and correct them. But in court, the order of things is that you get to talk, then the respondent gets to talk, and then you get to talk again. But the judge is going to tell you when it's your turn to talk, when it's the petitioner's turn, and when it's the respondent's turn. And that is really the only time that you are allowed to respond to things the respondent is saying or to answer the judge's question. And this kind of goes along with that. Remain as calm as you can during a respondent's testimony. My experience um, in practicing domestic violence law is that oftentimes the respondent's story is almost the exact opposite of the petitioner's generally and you know the respondents is not the truth so as a petitioner do your very best not to react um, to the respondents testimony um, do what you can to um, not have facial expressions or make any noises um, keep keep calm look down do what you can to not react to the things that they're saying after the hearing, um, you can risk request an escort from the sheriff's office. So have a sheriff's deputy walk you to your car if you're feeling unsafe about getting to your car because obviously the respondent is, is in the courtroom too. The respondent, you will be allowed to leave first. The respondent will be required to stay for five to 10 minutes. But you can still ask for an escort and that's even if your injunction is not granted. Um, you can still ask for a, um, a sheriff's deputy to walk you to your car if you're afraid. So, like I said, um, I was gonna give you some resources and phone numbers. So um, here at Legal Aid, like I said, we do provide assistance with injunctions for protection, um, also divorce, paternity, and other family law matters. And we also have attorneys that do a lot of other uh, things in the law, things like housing law, tax, immigration, and consumer law. So um, if you or any of your clients or participants 
um, have legal issues, I would encourage them to call our office, see if we can help with whatever legal problem it is that you have. Um, and again, the Shelter for Abused Women and Children is also a resource that people can access for um, assistance with injunctions, but also just the shelter has um, a whole bunch of resources for victims of intimate partner violence beyond just legal help um, for injunctions. Project Help um, is a great resource in the community for victims of sexual abuse and sexual violence. The Florida Domestic Violence Hotline is run by the Department of Children and Families here in Florida, and it's kind of a clearinghouse for all different resources for victims of intimate partner violence. And the last one is Collier County Lawyers Referral Service. Um, this is run by the Collier County Bar Association, um, and it can provide referrals to private lawyers. You can get consultations for $50, uh, I think for a half an hour consultation, um, and then go from there to see if it's an attorney that, that you'd like to hire. But I would encourage before taking that step of calling lawyers referral to reach out to legal aid to see if um, we can provide you with free legal help because all of our services are um, provided free of charge. So um, before um, you know, dishing out some money for an attorney, I would encourage you, to, um, you or your um, participants, your clients to call us um, and see if it's something that we can help with. So I now want to see if there's been any questions. Like I said, I haven't been able to see if there's been questions as I've gone. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, I would say now is the time. Um, I'm happy to answer them. My email is also there on the screen. So if anybody has a question, maybe they don't want to um, post it in the chat or they, um, would rather just ask me privately, uh, please send me, send me an email and um, I'm happy to address those questions. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now. I'll just wait a minute. Um, but I do wanna thank everybody for tuning in. Um, I do really appreciate the interest. And like I said, going forward, if anybody has any questions and um, for those of you um, involved in organizations that work with other victims of intimate partner violence, I want to thank you for the services that you provide. Uh, we really appreciate it. I know that it's uh, kind of a whole village here in, in supporting victims of intimate partner violence, and um, I want to thank you for what you do. So with that, um, it is just about one o'clock here. So I'm gonna end the presentation. Um, again, I did post the, the PowerPoint I just went through in the chat. So please review that. Let me know if you have any questions about it. And I hope that um, everyone stays safe and healthy and has a wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thanks, Katie.